Hello everyone, we are the Box Fans team and our mission is to make boxing safer and less violent. By creating a headgear that can record the strength of each punch, we want to remove violence from boxing and make it a game of rapidity and precision, just like what happened to fencing a few decades ago. In the previous phase of the prototyping fund, we created a headgear with a pre-made board and four sensors that could send data to our laptop through a Wi-Fi connection. In the second phase, we created our own custom board, much smaller and more efficient, substituted the speaker wires with a flexible PCB, and increased the number of sensors to six. Moreover, we run a patentability search that should lead us to the filing of a patent over the summer. But the thing that we're most excited to share with you today is another one. A user testing experience that we run in a real boxing gym with real boxing trainers. When the helmet gets hit, the system records the impact and displays it on a screen. This allows competitors to measure their performance fairly, without the need to physically harm each other. We believe that the majority of the people doing boxing today are reluctant to violence and want to practice this sport for different reasons. During our user testing experience, we ask people why they enjoy boxing. Some said they want to feel more secure. Others appreciate its technical and strategic aspects. For these individuals, boxing represents a unique form of athleticism and self-expression rather than a means of perpetrating violence. With our headgear, we want to change the rules of this sport, providing practitioners with a safer and non-violent way to engage in boxing. Hi, today we introduced the Arid Perfect Pole my prototyping project. It's a modular plant support solution. I'll start with an about me. My name is Cash Shao. I'm a freshman at NYU Stern studying business and computer science. So I'll start with a problem. What are climbing aeroids? Aeroids are a popular category of houseplants that are typically grown in the tropics, and they're adapted to climb up the trunks of trees, growing roots into the bark, and climbing towards the canopy, maturing as they do so. In order to replicate these conditions when growing houseplants indoors, plant enthusiasts typically grow using a mesh moss pole or a stake wrapped in cocoa core or a stake alone. So my issue with these products is that they can be pretty inconvenient and unwieldy to use. Traditional moss poles have to be watered daily, and cocoa core poles don't stay moist at all, so the roots are not able to grow into them. Furthermore, mesh moss poles also are really difficult to reuse and detangle plants from as roots become entangled and entrapped uh, in the mesh. So these are all the things I kept in mind when I moved on to establishing these design goals for the prototype. I wanted to create a moss pole that would be water retentive, aesthetically appealing, extendable using a modular system, inexpensive to produce and use, reusable, and that would anchor securely into the soil or pot the plant was within. So this led me to do initial testing, which was very basic, just a plastic shell uh, wrapped around an acrylic stake or dowel. And so I found that the plastic encasing made the, the moss stay moist for several days, a lot longer than in the mesh structure. And so this gave me the confidence to move on into uh, designing for modularity. So you can see here some of the sketches I did when I was thinking about how to make the product modular and extendable. And I went through a lot of design iterations and the first design I set on was this one off to the right here. This led me to create the assembly um, once I 3D printed all of the parts that are shown in black here. And so you can see I created an anchor and then there was a connector piece that connected each of the different um, sections together. And this, though it did work as planned, I found it was pretty unwieldy to use in that I had to have a three foot long acrylic stake, which is not really convenient to store or um, very adjustable. And so I designed to allow for shorter acrylic pieces that could be um, extended onto each other um, in versions one through three on off to the right here. And so you can see in green and yellow, um, the different designs I made. And so I moved towards this sort of wedge design, which would hold the plastic shell uh, close to the uh, back of the part. 
you can see them used here in the spring semester iteration. Um, here you can see three different plants um, that all implemented the design shown in the previous slide. Um, and though these were successful in holding moisture and were uh, extendable and pretty successfully, pretty successfully, I found that they tended to be a little bit unstable in the pots and they would wiggle around and tilt over and sometimes even tip over, which got really messy and inconvenient because as the moss poles were watered, they became really top heavy. And so I needed to come up with a better way to hold them upright and also to know when they were moist. And so for this, I moved on to the second semester of prototyping. So here are um, some more recent prototypes that um, are updated in black and white here. As you can see, um, there are kind of two primary areas that I wanted to focus on, um, moisture and stability. And stability was really an emphasis for this round of prototyping. You can see you're off to the left bottom here. Um, there are three different base versions I made. So first was a nursery pot base that connected directly to the prototype. Um, the acrylic dial basically seated in, seats into this um, a nursery pot. And this helps by attaching the nursery pot directly to the prototype so it can't wiggle around. Secondly, here is um, a base that is very small. And so this is for a hanging version of the, uh, of the pole, which has a small prototype and can be hung really nicely on the wall. And so this is very minimal. It's essentially just a smaller tube that slots around the prototype that also connects to the acrylic dowel. And it has some holes down the bottom to allow water to escape. And off to the right here, um, you can see I have a standard nursery pot. This is an octagonal one, which I use pretty often for my plants. And so I created this octagonal insert that holds, um, that holds the prototype upright in it. And so it slots very tightly into the shape of the nursery pot, which helps it to maintain upright. It's also quite large, a lot larger than the previous anchor that I designed in the last iteration of this prototype. And so that makes it a lot more stable and distributes weight a lot more e evenly. Uh, for moisture, I did two different strategies. First, I wanted to find a way to make it easier to tell when the pole needed watering. And so that's where I, uh, this um, water meter comes in. So I found these water meters online that are able to indicate the moisture of their surrounding substrate uh, with color. So the blue here means that the inside of the meter is moist. And so once it turns wet, I know that it's time to water the moss pole. And so I created this uh, sort of a disc shaped enclosure for it that allows me to sort of use it as a lid on the moss pole and that kind of seals in the moisture and lets me know when um, it's starting to dry out. And so that was really helpful in terms of uh, upkeep. Next, I looked into ways that I could water the moss pools more effectively. This has led me to this sort of drip wick watering design shown here in black um, with the string coming out. And that's actually a cotton wick cord that carries water that's stored inside of this black component uh, into the rest of the pole. So the black portion is a, um, a reservoir that wicks water out throughout the rest of the pole. And so that makes it quite easy to water. I just filled it up on occasion and it keeps the, mold, the pole moist. And so this piece, though it worked, it does look pretty unsightly in that it's kind of the wrong size. So in future iterations, I'm hoping to adjust that and make the fitment a little bit better. Uh, other plans of the future include um, making the tolerances a bit better. I found that some parts tend to be a little bit wiggly and inconsistent. This is also a problem I have in that it's hard to source very consistently diametered um, acrylic dowels. So I'm looking into printing with more flexible filaments and plastics. Um, other things I want to consider are printing in a better color. The black and white are pretty distracting. Ideally, I could print in brown, which matches the internal substrate, which is this magnum moss. Um, and um, I'm hoping to be able to test them with my friends, send them out to a couple people who are experienced using moss poles and growing these types of plants and having them test it. Acknowledgements. Um, I want to acknowledge Rochelle Xavier who helped me with um, Fusion 360, the NYU Prototyping Fund, and all the Makerspace TAs who trained and helped me throughout this project. If you have any questions, you can reach out and contact me. And I'd also like to uh, thank all of these people who contribute to the NYU Prototyping Fund. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. My name is Charu Dutt and I am a PhD student in Mechanical Engineering Department. Along with me, Anurag Nagdive and Shreyas Gondane are from Computer Engineering Department and Nishta Bhagat is a PhD student from Mechanical Engineering Department. We are working on creating a prototype of epilepsy monitoring device in NYU Prototyping Fund 2023. 
what is is a disease that is caused by abnormal electrical discharge in the brain when it happens people can experience coma or seizure thus patient needs immediate help we look at three reason one is the wider scope of epilepsy where every one out of 26 people can experience epilepsy in their lifetime the second thing we find is that this type of illness are urgent people who experience such pain must be hospitalized immediately and the third reason is monitoring such illness won't require expensive and sophisticated medical instrument it is affecting around 65 million people globally 80% of the patient are from low and middle income areas men gap in fact 70% of the people could live seizure free for rest of their life if proper diagnosis and treatment is provided however 75% of the people in the low income countries are not getting the treatment some possible causes for epilepsy are brain damages such as loss of oxygen or trauma during birth or genetic condition or severe head injuries so our product as a group we designed and built a system to detect epileptic activity using an electrodermal activity sensor that is the gsr sensor an accelerometer and a gyroscope which is integrated into a bno055 sensor this sensor are selected for the ability to detect changes in physiological signal that are indicative of epileptic seizure prototyping process we first designed a prototype of the system selecting and testing each sensor to ensure that it provided accurate and reliable data We then connected the sensor to an Arduino microcontroller that collected the data from the sensor and sent it to computer for processing. We wrote the program using Arduino programming language that collected data from the sensor and sent it to computer over serial connection. We also implemented a filtering algorithm to remove noise from the data and make it easier to detect epileptic activity. Technical description: Using the data collected from the patient who have been diagnosed with epilepsy, we tested the system's ability to detect epileptic activity we refined the system based on our testing making adjustment to the sensor and the program to improve its accuracy and reliability ultimately we were successful in building a system to detect epileptic activity using a gsr sensor accelerometer gyroscope and a magnetometer along with the arduino microcontroller our system was designed to be portable and easy to use and could be deployed in a variety of settings and to monitor patients with epilepsy So, talking about the processing of a data, the processing of a data in an epilepsy device involves the collection of a analysis of sensor data and ensure the accuracy and reliability of the system. The selection of appropriate sensors and the application of effective filtering algorithms are essential components in achieving these objectives. The use of graph analysis can assist in visualizing patterns, figuring out the anomalies in data, and ultimately leading to the improvised system performance. As you can see, we have graphed out all the data of x, y, and z axis of accelerometer plus gyroscope, and we put it in a graph format. As well as we are showing the sensor data in the graphical formats that helps us analyze to choose an algorithm and work with it. The development of an epilepsy device and a monitoring device system provides an invaluable hands-on experience in a range of technical areas. Steps of data extraction, visualization. calibration deciding on offsets and debugging were equally important learnings for designing a personalized wearable device for epilepsy patients in totality we aim to make a low cost iot enabled wearable device useful for potential epilepsy patients our unique selling point will be the portability low cost small form factor device so that it is not bulky to wear and accessible to a large population thank you Hello everyone. This is Gate Measurement Systems team. I am Vaishnavi Gupta and Kirtuka Chandrasekhar. We are from the Masters in Mechatronics and Robotics course. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss our innovative wearable device for analyzing gait or walking patterns in the elderly. Falls can have a significant impact on an individual's quality of life, including their ability to perform daily activities and maintain independence. As a result there is a need for effective fall prevention strategies that can help reduce the risk of falls and improve the quality of life for older adults. 
Our project aims to address this need by developing a wearable device that can analyze gait or walking patterns in the elderly. By monitoring key parameters such as leg sway and ankle angle, our device can detect any abnormalities in walking patterns and alert caretakers and family members to take appropriate action. We believe that our device has the potential to make a significant impact on the lives of older adults by reducing the risk of falls and improving their overall quality of life. Falls are the leading cause of injury-related death among adults aged 65 and older, and the age-adjusted fall death rate is increasing. The age-adjusted fall death rate is 64 deaths per 100,000 older adults. About 36 million falls are reported among older adults each year, resulting in more than 32,000 deaths. Each year, about 3 million older adults are treated in emergency rooms for a fall injury. With our product, we aim to reduce these statistics by detecting any abnormalities in gait patterns and alerting caregivers to take appropriate precautions. Our device is designed to monitor and analyze the gait patterns of elderly individuals and provide alerts to their caregivers or doctors when necessary. This can help prevent falls, reduce the risk of injuries, and ensure that elderly individuals receive timely medical attention. Now let's talk about the methodology that we use to develop this device. We connected the sensors to the Arduino board and the battery and then assembled all the electronic parts and mounted them on the ankle brace. This ankle brace can be worn by the users to collect data, which will be stored in the micro SD card. Our product is designed to be convenient and easy to use. Imagine an eight elderly person aged between 70 to 80 who is at a heightened risk of falling. If the gait patterns are monitored and you receive an alert regarding abnormal walking pattern, you can take the elderly person for a checkup. Our product is a wearable compression sock with an attached sensor that can measure leg sway, ankle angle, and report any kind of abnormality in the walking pattern based on the readings from the sensor. The data collected is aimed to be accurate enough for clinical evidence so that the patient can be treated or precautions can be taken to prevent falls in those elderly individuals. We assembled all the electronic parts and mounted them on the ankle brace. The ankle brace can be worn by the users to collect data, which is then stored on a micro SD card. However, we learned that creating a prototype that will be taking measurements at the ankle doesn't have to be an ankle brace. We can make the wearability more comfortable by incorporating soft sensors in the soles of shoes, which can further increase the number of parameters being measured, like the amount of weight on each foot and the plantar pressure. We discovered that plantar force pressure plays an important role in gait analysis. The following properties of the gait cycle were measured ankle angle, ankle drop, and leg sway. But we still need to incorporate knee angle, ankle perturbations, and plantar pressure at toes and heels as a part of our next steps. This would make our prototype even more accurate. Our next steps include incorporating these additional parameters into our device to make it even more accurate. We also plan to have user feedback on the comfort of wear and feedback from doctors regarding the analysis software. This could give us better understanding and help take proper precautions, thus preventing falls in the elderly people and protecting them. In conclusion, we hope to make a significant impact on the health and safety of elderly individuals through our innovative wearable device. We appreciate your time and thank you for joining us today. Hello, my name is Frank Dolko, and I am a second year ITP student at NYU. For my thesis project, I wanted to create an interactive physical representation of logic gates and their functionality in a fun and playful way. Logic gates are how computers make decisions. They work based on Boolean algebra and are fundamental to electronics. Logic gates are made up of transistors or switches. In 1971, the first commercially produced microprocessor had over 2,000 transistors. Today, we have microprocessors containing as high as 67 billion transistors. As the technology we use every day gets more and more complex, we are further abstracted from the underlying computer hardware making our devices work. I often see online or hear in person people 
Young and old, curious how our computers work with just ones and zeros. Sharing this fascination, I want to create a way to more easily understand and interact with this particular phenomenon of computer hardware. My final prototype can be described as Legos, but for building logic circuits. I created a series of modular blocks with different functionalities that can be joined together in different ways to simulate a logic circuit. I created three classes of blocks. The input block is connected to the input of a gate block and can be switched on and off. The gate block receives two inputs and then can be connected to an output block or the input of another gate block. I created four types of gate blocks mimicking the symbolism and nomenclature of traditional logic gates. Lastly is the output block, which displays the state of the output of the block it is connected to using an LED. Prototyping included iterations from breadboards to cardboard to protoboards to eventually 3D printing. I would say the most pivotal change that occurred during this process was deciding to forego the magnetic pogo connectors I intended to use from the start. This change opened up many possibilities and solved a lot of issues I was having. From user feedback, I was able to incorporate design decisions such as the rounded edges, coloring, and labeling of the blocks. User feedback also validated decisions such as using a block motif and the particular switches I used on the input blocks. Three learnings I had from the prototyping fund are 1. Don't underestimate the importance of drawings and diagrams. 2. Don't be too married to an idea early on and keep an open mind to other options. And 3. The importance of iteration. You can never have too many prototypes. There are many aspects of this concept that can be considered as next steps. I have received many suggestions from feedback as well as have my own ideas that were just not feasible to include in this time frame. Firstly, I can produce my own circuit boards to increase the rate and efficiency of production. Secondly, I originally intended to have each block light up depending on its state, not just the output block. However, this raised power concerns since the only blocks with batteries are the input blocks. I could make the decision for each block to have a battery of its own and incorporate more complex board design to light each block using its own power. Next, I would like to create more functional output schemes, such as a 7 segment display or just simply a binary to decimal display. Finally, these four gate blocks barely scratch the surface of digital circuits. The gate blocks can be expanded to accept more than two inputs, and more complex circuits could be created using a clock block. This project was as much an exercise in user experience and product design for me as it was to create this logic gate experience. I learned a lot from this process and gained skills I will use for the rest of my career. and I'm a freshman in computer science. Hi, my name is Edene and I am a freshman pursuing chemical and biomolecular engineering at Tandon. Hi, my name is Indira and I'm a freshman at NYU in computer science. And we're period. Menstruation is a normal bodily experience shared by about half the world. And yet there seems to be this ick factor that's tied to any discussion of it. Even in the academic world, the social stigma of periods has kept research on them quite limited, and those who have periods are often placed under systemic pressures to uphold their best selves in spite of it. It's like a battle with their own bodies. The hormonal cycle for individuals that menstruate lasts 28 days compared to the one-day cycle for those who don't. They typically experience a week of bleeding, which may be paired with cramps, mood swings, and general pain. However, there seems to be a lack of accommodations for such individuals, making their periods inconvenient to daily life. We don't want that for them, so we have something that might help. Period is an implementation of discrete wearable technology that targets period pain. This high-waisted piece of underwear employs varying levels of heating compression around the uterine area, which can be adjusted to a user's preference through our mobile app. Additionally, the fin design allows for it to be concealed under everyday clothes, prioritizing comfort even in public settings. Our ultimate objective is this. To create a reliable, jug-free solution. 
for those undergoing any type of menstrual pain. When beginning the prototyping process, we learned that an increased level of contraction in an individual's uterus typically meant that they experienced more pain, which would necessitate stronger pain relievers. So our original design had muscle sensors to detect contractions, which would then provide pre-programmed levels of heat in response. The shape resembled a waist trainer, so that it could be worn discreetly under everyday clothes. While this design was sufficient for our engineering class, it still felt incomplete. In fact, we only realized during our final presentation the profound impact that it had on our classmates and professors. Their hope is exactly what inspired us to make our project better. We started the semester by conducting menstrual-related surveys on social media. Results revealed that people who experience periods often feel pain in their uterine and lower back regions, with intense pain lasting over 20 minutes at a time, multiple times a day. Heat, compression, and medication were the top remedies. This information, when paired with the help of the staff and the students of the Prototyping Fund, helped us begin our user-centered approach. The new design still incorporates heating technology on the front, as well as now on the back, a recommendation from user feedback. Plus, we added controls for compression. Although our waist trainer did provide pressure, we learned that not everyone felt comfortable in it. So, we switched to high-waisted underwear. We realized that this design did not allow for users to have flexible experiences of comfort. So we created an app to accompany our prototype, allowing users to choose the level of heat and compression provided by the underwear's high-waisted band. We then removed the muscle sensors altogether. Thus, people have complete autonomy over their safe external pain relievers. Though we're focused on technology right now, we're also testing different materials to create period-safe underwear. But that's more so for the future. We learned quite a lot from the prototyping process. For instance, you must aspire to fail before you fathom success. Now, we approach every setback with genuine curiosity, having recognized that our worst case scenario is to simply learn, adapt, and find a new path toward our goal. It helps a lot that we believe no matter what that, it will always work out in the end. Moreover, while a certain feature may seem cool, we now know that we have to prioritize practicality as to better cater towards the real-life needs of our users. Though our muscle sensor approach was unique, it took away from the user's choice in their comfort. In other words, just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we should. Finally, it's impossible to create the perfect product, not to mention incredibly time-consuming and resource-intensive. Every solution just complicated our design more and more. We had to try our best and move on. So yes, it may be important to dream big, but it's equally important to stay grounded in reality. After the semester, we will shift our focus to improving our technological design and user experience. We hope to investigate other means of alleviating menstrual pain other than heat and compression and assess their effectiveness against our current design by conducting field tests. We will then integrate these possible new features on our app's interface. This research is to primarily ensure that our method to alleviating period pain is practical. But beyond all of this, we want to normalize periods and overwrite the stigma associated with them. No more excuses. We want to prompt more research about managing menstruation. To create remedies that are both effective and convenient for alleviating pain. Though it may not get rid of the ick factor. It's definitely a step in the right direction. And that's on period. Hello. We are building diagnostic robotics. These are our team members. Our mission is to use robotics and AI to develop building envelope inspection reports for building engineers. The current process for building inspections is labor-intensive, costly, and time-consuming. The inspections are done with multiple different instruments, since identifying moisture, thermal, or air anomalies can be very difficult. In the past, we've performed these scans using a cart robot that needed to be pushed around a roof by an operator. After customer discovery, we learned that a priority for the engineers is to eliminate labor. Our primary focus for this semester was to build an autonomous roof inspection robot that would be easy to carry, rugged, 
and able to integrate multiple sensors. The roof inspection robot has a ground penetrating radar, or GPR, that can identify moisture in the roof. The robot also uses a camera and call map for position tracking. From data collected from the CART robot, we were able to create moisture reports by superimposing the moisture map onto a satellite image of the roof. In previous iterations, we ran into issues with the robot getting stuck on parts of the roof, so the GPR was not able to scan properly. There were also issues with the motors that drove the wheels being too weak to move over certain obstructions on the roof. The roof robot uses track wheels to ensure it can steadily move around the roof and high-torque DC motors to help it move over small obstructions. We knew from past experiences that being careless regarding the mechanical design would lead to more problems in the fabricating and manufacturing phases. We also wanted high-quality parts to ensure that the robot could produce results of a high accuracy. We ordered as many standard parts as possible from places like McMaster. The aluminum plate was cut using the Makerspace water jet, and all other parts were machined using the Makerspace drill press, horizontal band saw, and laser cutter. Since we took our time and meticulously designed the new iteration of the roof robot, we were able to move through the manufacturing process quickly and efficiently. We were also able to improve upon the design from last semester, since we had issues with the robot not being able to move over certain obstacles or having motors that were too low torque. One issue we ran into was our choice of motor. We were very concerned with how the motor would mechanically fit into the higher assembly, but we did not investigate the electrical design. We learned that the motor we purchased needed a separate custom driver. We ended up returning the motor and purchasing a new one, but we lost valuable time because of this mistake. We had three key takeaways from this semester. The first is that moving forward, we want to start setting deadlines for different parts of the prototyping phase. This ensures that we are able to meet our overall deadlines. The second is the importance of material selection. This semester, we focused on buying high-quality parts from reputable websites, and that sped up our manufacturing process drastically. The third is to build a product that is easy to use. Based on customer discovery, we learned that ease of use was very important to engineers. Even if our technology is innovative, it's important that people are actually able to use it. Next steps for our work will be to integrate similar technology onto a cable-driven wall climber. This robot would be able to use the GPR to scan walls for moisture and other anomalies, and it would use structure from motion pipelines to track its position on the wall. Ultimately, we would deliver a report that precisely marks the location of moisture pain points on building envelopes. We also want to integrate other sensors, such as an RGB camera, thermal camera, and LiDAR. We can also use LiDAR and the GPR to identify anomalies other than moisture. Thank you to the Makerspace team for all their help and support. This is the first iteration of a smart bin design. The first iteration had three key features. First of which was the opening of the doors, which would lead to three different compartments. The second one was the segregator plate that would help segregate the garbage into their respective compartments. And the third key feature was the addition of a fan at the bottom of the bin that would help place a new garbage cover once the previous one was removed. There were two major flaws in this design. The first one was the cost of the linear actuators. 
since they were too expensive they were replaced with cost effective servo motors and with a few tweaks to our segregated mechanism this is the final iteration of the segregator mechanism that is implemented the second flaw that we identified was due to the design of the previous doors the user would have to reach into the bins to grab the garbage bags however by implementing slide out bins the user finds it easier to remove the garbage bags we have also used four bins instead of three in this design to incorporate different types of garbages garbage wastes in addition to the fan we have also incorporated a sealing mechanism that helps seal the garbage bags that are already full so that it is easier for the user to dispose of them this is the outdoor waste collection bin it is going to be used by the customers to throw away their trash and for waste collectors to come pick the trash up but as you can see this bin is currently locked and only people with access can uh, open this bin so now i'm going to show you how we operate this bin we begin by scanning the qr code which redirects us to the website in the website i have to enter the right password and when i press login the bin unlocks and i can open it after which when i close it it locks itself again thereby increasing security Hi, my name is Toby Adeyeva and I'm an electrical engineering major year attending. I am a senior and I'm passionate about renewable energy and green technology. Hi, my name is Rafi Mio. I'm a second year mechanical engineering student. I'm also a makerspace TA and I'm passionate about energy efficiency. So what's the problem? The demand for renewable energy is increasing rapidly and solar energy is one of the most abundant and accessible sources of renewable energy. However, the efficiency of solar panels panels is limited by the angle of incidence of sunlight and their output is affected by shadows and changes in weather conditions fixed solar panels can only generate electricity at their maximum efficiency for a limited time each day and their output decreases during periods of low solar radiation to solve this problem we came up with solar swivel and the aim of solar swivel is to improve the efficiency and performance of solar pv panels by using a solar tracking system to adjust the angle of the solar panels to ensure that they are always facing the sun, maximizing the amount of solar radiation they receive throughout the day. For the electrical components, we used, I used a photoresistor for the sensor, an external power supply, an Arduino Uno, and a control algorithm. For the photoresistors, I used the intense. For the mechanical components and mounts, the main movement for the mechanical com component was from servo motors. Servo motors is a device that allows rotational movement from 0 to 180 degrees of rotation. It can also be controlled through code to make adjustments to the degree of rotation. The second component for the mechanical parts is a mount. The mount will be added in order to attach the solar panel and to remove the solar panel in case it needs to be replaced over long periods of time. Possible design. So the current design that we first in, uh, designed was a two cylindrical component that has actuators that will tilt based off the intensity of the sunlight. It would move in a forward and backward motion. The storage would also be underneath the box as a means to keep the Arduino and wires. However, we had to make changes in the design. The old design would require expensive actuators. These expensive actuators would not only raise our cost, but it would pivot away from our main objective. We wanted to design something that was inexpensive, uh, inexpensive means to require solar energy. This only allowed two-way movement as well. It would either move in back and forth motion or side to side motion, but we wanted 360s. So in return, we created a new design where it was not only lower cost, 
but also need lower parts. It was easy to replicate and implement. It was also ex inexpensive in that it could be also mass produced to further reduce the cost. We used servo motors, attach mounts, photoresistors, and some wires. It was basic 3D printing to uh, integrate into a newer component. Furthermore, if additional funding was provided, we would create Solar Swivel 2.0. This design would allow 180 degree rotation on the base component, as well as the physical solar panel, creating a 360 degree design. It would also be low cost in design and adjustable for various solar panels, making it more variable and accessible. Furthermore, this would, provide us, this would allow us to be one, close, close, one step closer to a rooftop mount design. The electrical components would also stay fairly the same, with slight changes. Some of the key takeaways from this build process was first, build fast and iterate quickly. We spent a lot of time trying to make everything perfect on a piece of paper before building. Next time, we'll build first and then iterate. Another lesson we learned from this process was to communicate often and keep each other accountable. During the process, during the process of building this first prototype, we had a lot of other projects and class assignments to deal with and some weeks will go by without progress. Next time, we'll keep ourselves accountable. And the last lesson we learned was to have multiple designs and extra components for backup. We usually had problems with our components, either we couldn't get a supply on time, or some components would break. We would get extra components for backup and, extra ma and also make backup designs. Hello everyone, this is the team Solenoid Engine presenting for the Makerspace Prototyping Fund and we are excited to share our journey as we learn more about engineering. We have learned a lot throughout the process of designing, manufacturing and testing the Solenoid Engine prototype and we are excited to share our journey with you. Thank you for being here and we hope that you enjoy our presentation. The depletion of crude oil reserves is a global concern that has led to a shift towards sustainable and renewable sources of energy. As a result, the automotive industry is transitioning from internal combustion engines to electrical vehicles. However, this transition is not easy, as it involves significant changes in the mechanical and electrical systems of cars. Traditional electric vehicles have different mechanisms from gasoline engines, making it difficult to retrofit them into existing cars. This leaves car owners with two options, discard their old cars with, uh, and purchase new electric vehicles or keep using their old cars and contribute to the pollution caused by internal combustion engines. The solenoid engine concept emerged as a potential solution to this problem. By utilizing the same mechanical principles as a gasoline engine, the solenoid engine could be retrofitted into existing cars making them electric and environmentally friendly. The idea behind this concept was to develop an alternative to a traditional electrical vehicles that could help extend the lifespan of existing, existing cars while also reducing their carbon footprint. The solenoid engine is still in its prototype phase and there are challenges that need to be addressed before it can be implemented on a larger scale. However, the idea behind the concept represents a large step towards sustainable and efficient transportation solutions. It also highlights the importance of innovation and creativity in addressing global challenges. The solenoid engine is a unique alternative to traditional combustion engines that uses solenoids to generate rotational motion. To better understand how this works, it is important to have a basic understanding of how traditional engines work, such as the V8 engine. A V8 engine is a type of combustion engine that has eight combustion chambers, each of which has a piston that moves up and down in a linear motion. The motion of the pistons is converted into a rational motion using a crankshaft, which connects the pistons to the drive shaft. The solenoid, en solenoid engine replaces the combustion chamber with solenoids, which are essentially electromagnets that perform the same function. Instead of relying on combustion of fuel, the solenoid engine uses electrical energy to activate the solenoids, which creates a magnetic field that pushes and pulls a metal rod attached to the crankshaft. The motion is then converted into rotational motion uh, using the same crankshaft mechanism as its traditional engines. The firing order of a solenoid engine is crucial to its operation. 
as it ensures that the cylinders fire in the correct sequence to efficiently translate linear motion into rotational motion. In a solenoid engine, the firing order is 18436572, which is the same as a traditional V8 engine. This firing order is achieved using a crankshaft that is designed with a cam mechanism corresponding to each separate solenoid. When the cam mechanism rotates, it activates a microswitch which sends a signal to a MOSFET transistor that activates a solenoid using a 36 volt power supply. This process ensures that the solenoids are fired sequentially in the correct order to complete one revolution. By using this firing order, the solenoid engine can efficiently produce rotational motion using linear motion, such as a traditional, uh, just like a traditional gasoline engine. The use of electronics to activate the solenoids is a key aspect of solenoid engine's design. The solenoids need to be activated in the correct sequence to ensure proper operation, and electronics provide a precise and reliable method of doing so. The cam mechanisms, microswitches, MOSFET transistors, and power supply all work together seamlessly to ensure that the solenoid engine operates smoothly and efficiently. Manufacturing the solenoid required access to advanced tools and machinery, which were provided by the makerspace. These tools included a water jet cutter, CNC mill, CNC lathe, and the other mill. The team provided a total of 97 individual components, which were then assembled to create the solenoid engine prototype. During the process of developing the solenoid engine, the team faced the challenge of selecting the right gauge of wire to be used in the electromagnet. The team sampled wires of different gauges including 32, 26, 24, and 22, which increasing diameters and after conducting experiments, it was found that 32 gauge wire was too thin to hold an adequate amount of current and had too much resistance. On the other hand, 22 gauge wire had the least amount of resistance but due to its thickness, it was not possible to increase the number of loops on the coil which decrease the magnetic capabilities. After considering all these factors, 24 and 26 gauge wires were experimentally found to be the best for our purposes. These wires had low resistance yet they were, they were thin enough to allow for a sufficient number of loops on the coil, which helped to increase the magnetic field strength. This highlights the importance of an experimental testing and iteration during development uh, process to achieve the best possible results. Another point of failure was the crank assembly, originally designed to be epoxied together with a stainless steel pen. However, the stresses produced during the movement caused the pin to fail. To address these concerns identified during the product testing, the team is exploring alternative methods and designs for crankshaft assembly, such as using a single piece of metal instead of multiple parts or using stronger adhesives. Moving forward, the team plans to continue refining the solenoid engine prototype and exploring the potential for commercial use. With further development and testing, the solenoid engine could revolutionize the automotive industry and pave the way for a more sustainable future. A special thank you for Makerspace for getting this project off the ground. We believe that this is just the start of an incredible journey towards a more sustainable and equitable future. It's no secret that the fashion industry is taking an enormous toll on our planet. According to an article by the World Economic Forum, the fashion industry produces 10% of all of humanity's carbon emissions. That's more emissions than all international flights and maritime shipping combined. Additionally, the fashion industry is the second largest consumer of the world's water supply. With the impending state of current production processes used to produce clothing, we wanted to leverage technology as well as innovative materials to see how we could create a more sustainable solution for consumers. Additionally, a big component of design is rapid prototyping and iteration. So we wanted to ideate how we might make that process more sustainable and eco-conscious. Terrestrial Adornments is a sustainable outfit that utilizes 3D printing and biomaterials to ensure a more circular design process. The top is a matte white PLA that was modeled in Blender as well as Fusion 360 and printed on a Creality CR10. It was strung together with wire and a jute twine. The bead adornments and belt are also PLA and were 3D printed using a Prusa. The skirt is made of an alginate foil and vegan gelatin bioplastic stitched together with jute twine and standard sewing thread. We started out with some concept sketches as well as making a mood board to determine our aesthetic goals for the design. For this project, we prototyped with 3D printing as well as biomaterials. Starting out with 3D printing, we wanted to see what types of biofilaments were on the market to ensure a more sustainable prototyping process with printing parts. 
Inspired by a recent 3D printed garment utilizing a fillet made of cacao beans by Dutch designer Iris van Herpen, we searched for similar alternatives. We came across filaments made of beer byproducts, hemp, as well as coffee. We settled on using the coffee filament since we really liked the color. After locating some of our materials for 3D printing, we needed to test out the Creality CR10. Initially, we printed a calibration cube as well as an intricate vessel utilizing the coffee PLA. Both came out great. Next step, we wanted to print beads. To go about printing the beads, we first modeled in Fusion 360 and then refined after printing. Once we made some edits with the coffee filament, we switched to a matte white PLA since we wanted to create an ethereal monochromatic look. The Creality was having a lot of issues with printing the beads since the filament would not adhere each time the printer extruder moved. So as a result, there were a lot of print fails. Eventually, we decided to try printing on the Prusa as well as an Ultimaker. The Prusa worked great, so we kept using that. At first, while using the Prusa, we set the Cura file to have the beads print one at a time. So this way, if there was a print fail, we wouldn't lose the whole batch. However, this was taking a very long time and was not printing as many beads as we would like within one batch. So we decided to try printing them all at once and we were actually able to successfully create over 200 beads with one print. Granted, we did have another failure, so we lost one whole batch, but we were able to run this file twice, each time taking well over 29 hours. As we were churning out beads, we were also prototyping the top. First, after talking to multiple experts about 3D printing, we decided to do a 3D scan of our model at NYCAP3D so we could design a custom fit for the 3D model. We first modeled the top in Blender, which led to a lot of issues, being that Blender is not an ideal modeling software for creating scalable objects to be used physically. The file was so large that our computers couldn't handle making any adjustments, but we did manage to get it into Cura to try printing. It worked, albeit with the need of some adjustments. Eventually, one of our professors informed us of the Decimate tool in Blender, which essentially simplifies the meshes of 3D models, so we're able to simplify the geometry to our top's mesh to make it more workable and scale it in Fusion 360, and eventually Cura to be printed. We did another test print in the coffee filament and then made some adjustments using Maya to make certain parts thicker where it was too flimsy. After adjusting, we printed in the white PLA for the final iteration of the cups. The connecting torso piece was also done in Fusion 360, and at first the model was way too thick, so it would be protruding off of the body too much. So we stopped the print halfway through and edited it in Fusion more to our liking. We printed it again on the Creality. After all of the printing, we assembled the top and chain belt using wire, linen thread coated with wax, as well as jewelry clasps. Inspired by the creations of designer Neri Oxman, we also wanted to integrate biomaterials into our outfit in the form of a skirt. First, we attempted to make alum crystals. However, after three tries, it kept failing. So we resorted to purchasing preformed seed crystals to potentially integrate it into our design. After that, we also produced several batches of gelatin bioplastic and biofoam, as well as an alginate biofoil and a vegan gelatin bioplastic. Interestingly enough, each batch came out very, very different for all of the materials. The most consistent material, however, from batch to batch was the gelatin bioplastic. After creating many sheets of biomaterials, we prototyped flats for a skirt using craft paper, painter's tape, and jute twine. After assembling the flats, we cut pieces of the biomaterials to the size of the pre-measured flats. We decided to use the alginate foil and vegan gelatin bioplastic to maintain a sleek translucent look that would be overlaid with the white PLA. After organizing what materials would be used where, we sewed the skirt together using a linen thread covered in wax as well as sewing thread and reinforced some places with hot glue. From there, we then fastened it to the beaded belt so the model could clip it on around their waist. This is the final look. Key learnings from the prototyping process were as follows. Use the correct software for the job. All 3D printers have their pros and cons. Sure you make time in your design process for potential print fails. Lastly, don't be afraid to ask for help. Going forward, we are envisioning that we will keep refining this hop, particularly the cups, and print with other materials, such as a TPU, which is far more flexible than a rigid PLA. 
Additionally, we'd also like to keep designing other 3D printed garments and eventually put them into production to be scaled and sold. My work has been to create biodegradable bioplastic plants that are sustainable and eliminate the need for synthetic material. There's a plant lover revolution happening, but not everyone has a green thumb. And when those people want plants, they resort to fake synthetic materials, which are pretty terrible for the environment. What if your fake plant was still made with organic material and actually looked, felt, and smelled real? Although I'm not trying to eliminate people's desire for real plants, my hope is to provide a more sustainable and beautiful alternative to add greenery to your home. That is, until you no longer want this plant and you can leave it to decompose or cut it up and use it as a compost in your fertilizer for your real plants. I've learned a lot during this process, especially in terms of dealing with materials, what to use, how much of the ingredients to use, as well as the pieces that make up a bioplastic. I've gained a better understanding of working with biomaterials in this process and how to create malleable, functionable structures that provide an eco-friendly solution to a very small part of our world's plastic problem. There's been a lot of material testing for these plants, especially in regards to biomaterials that will last and won't grow mold. The most promising material for the leaves is a gelatin bioplastic that provides durability and flexibility. When added with a blue-green algae and a bit of essential oils, this bioplastic turns green and smells great. Testing how well biomaterials fare over time has eliminated certain materials. Agar agar, for instance, forms mold much more rapidly than gelatin, especially when in contained petri dishes. So I've eliminated these recipes from my mix. In the current process, I'm testing two versions of leaves, larger ones to mimic birds of paradise plant leaves, as well as smaller ones to mimic ivy leaves. I've begun to gain efficiency with these materials to continue refining my recipes to craft these bioplastics into a full plant. This has been a very large incubation period to test out these different materials, especially their measurements and durability and longevity and flexibility to find the absolute best solution for a biomaterial that can be produced on a larger scale with long-term sustainability that would eventually decompose without growing mold or starting to smell odd or have too much shrinkage. It's going to be important to create a mold for the leaf outline so that all of my leaves are identical in shape and thickness. Then there's the addition of a malleable material to act as a stem to the leaves as well as producing mycelium pots and a coffee compost for the plant's dirt. For phase two of this process, I bought pre-made silicone molds. So I wanted to have a common denominator for size. I could then see how much shrinkage happens later. At first, I experimented with mica powder. Mica powder comes in a variety of colors. The only issue with that was that the colors didn't look incredibly natural even when I mixed them for different color combinations. Because of this, I decided to test beetroot powder as well as matcha powder. Smell was something else to consider during this part of the process. Another test was to use herbal water instead of regular water to see if the herbal smell would stay persistent over time. Using essential oils did help in the short term. There wasn't too much of a difference over the long term. Beetroot had a lot of shrinkage, as did the matcha, probably about a full inch in total over two to three weeks. I definitely had my fair share of fails throughout this process as well. If you don't add the ingredients at the right order, at the right temperature, you end up with really clumpy material, which is not what you want. At this phase of the process, I was able to experiment a lot with what worked and what didn't. What was exciting was that this material does boil away. So when you're finished with your plant or you decide you no longer want it, you can put it in boiling water and put it down the drain. Hello, my name is James Arsenault. I am a freshman at Tandon studying electrical engineering here to showcase my project, the Virtual Saxophone. The purpose of this project was to create an electronic alternative to an acoustic saxophone. Acoustic saxophones are made out of solid brass and weigh up to 15 pounds and are up to 15 feet long. They require frequent maintenance and can cost up to $10,000. On top of that, saxophones can be difficult to learn without long hours of practice and lessons. These factors result in a high barrier of entry to new players who want to learn the saxophone. As a solution to this problem, I have created the Virtual Saxophone, a portable, durable, easy-to-use instrument that can play music on any device that reads MIDI. The instrument uses 27 buttons, 3 potentiometers, and an airflow sensor connected to an Arduino to read input from the user, 
translate them into notes, and send them as MIDI signals to a virtual keyboard on your computer. Here is an example of me playing the song Green Sleeves. <laughs> After I'm done, I can also record the background part. You will notice that I made some mistakes while I was playing, but that's fine. I can simply edit out all the bad notes. Once I'm finished, I can play both parts together, playing a duet with myself. <laughs> This project is actually a second iteration of a project I began last semester, as a semester-long design project during my Intro to Engineering class. With my team of fellow students, we were able to create a model that worked, but it was fragile and cumbersome to use. I did a complete redesign of the entire saxophone with custom parts to ensure it felt ergonomic. I created custom parts in Onshape that would form the shell for the saxophone. I printed them using the Makerspace 3D printers. I wired the buttons, potentiometers, airflow sensor, and Arduino together and then put the entire saxophone together. Afterwards, it was all a matter of coding and playtesting to ensure the best sound and user experience. When I first submitted an order to the Makerspace to print the saxophone, I realized that the parts were too large for even the largest 3D printer to make. The saxophone was originally made out of a single piece each for the front and back. I had to split the pieces in two for them to fit, which is why the middle section of the saxophone is held together with a piece of tape. The most difficult part of this project was without a doubt the wiring. Every single button and electronic component needed to be soldered together correctly. There are a total of about 36 wires that are connected to the Arduino. If instead I had used custom PCBs, I could have reduced the amount of wires I had to use and saved myself a lot of headache. Lastly, while this version of the virtual saxophone is a vast improvement over its first iteration, there are still many improvements I would like to make in a third version. Currently, the saxophone can only play music by connecting to a computer via USB. I would like to make the saxophone wireless and install a speaker so it can play notes by itself. In the future, I would like to create my own software application to connect with the saxophone and control its settings remotely.